안녕하세요. Good morning, everyone. 2021 평창 평화 포럼 청소년 Welcome 세션에 이르는 청소년 평화 문화라는 주제 session on peace culture for youth at the Pyeongchang Peace Forum. I am your moderator for today. I am Kang Ji Yeon, board chair at the Korea Street Culture Foundation. Let me begin by thanking you for being with us in this early hour in the morning on a Monday. Our federation aims to enhancing accessibility towards cultural resources and experience in rural or remote area for sustainable community. And we are educating the youth through our own uh, curriculum and we are also providing assistance for sustainable living for different communities. And we have an arts platform that we are operating as well. And our participants are the young students, elementary, middle, high school students, as well as their families. And we focus on peace and ecology issues for culture and art activities by art education, exhibition campaigns, as well as forums. This uh, peace, issue of peace is actually a broad discourse topic. And so uh, it may be difficult for us to understand the importance, the implications of peace when we see if we see it broadly. But then we're hoping that peace becomes a part of our daily lives, so something that we can feel in our daily activities. And so that is the reason why we have decided to host this session on peace. So the young children as well as the youth and their understanding about their future and the experiences would be of utmost importance. And to continue or lead in this discussion, we're going to focus on the need to establish peace culture for youth, what their role should be, and what kinds of uh, youth peace culture activities are going on, as well as examples from other countries. So that is what we will be discussing today. The beginning of a peace is right here in Pyeongchang. And we are having this meaningful discussion on peace culture for youth here in Pyeongchang. We are really grateful for the opportunity, and we have many leading experts with us in this session as well. And so we appreciate that very much. Peace studies, international studies, arts and sports field experts are gathered as speakers and panelists in this session, and they are sparing their valuable time with us, so we really appreciate that. Let me now introduce our speakers and panelists, and then we will listen to their presentations. First, we have someone who will uh, talk about the peace culture for youth. We have Dr. Chang Su Yun, and she is a manager for or uh, worked as a researcher in the Stockholm Institute for six years, and she did studies as well as field work. And right now, she is working as a manager for the UN Peacekeeping Ministerial Preparatory Secretariat. And although he is not here physically, we have Ioannis Talidis, who is a professor at Gyeonggi University. He is connected online. He majored in international studies, but he is uh, his research is on um, the graffiti message, and so he's been conducting a lot of related research, and so that is uh, what he will be sharing with us today on his the results of his graffiti research. And also in the field of art, so we have someone who has been working directly. We have Moon Jung Won, who is a senior curator of KTNG Sang Sang Madang. And the curator Moon has been conducting various sustainability based arts activities for the youth in this position. And last but not least, we have from Kangwon National University, Professor Kwon Ki Sung. And Professor Kwon is working here in Pyeongchang, and he's been conducting peace activities that is uh, conducted through uh, the different peace culture activities for the youth here in Pyeongchang. Uh, particularly, uh, you talked about uh, the many definitions to peace, but that also there are many definitions to youth. And depending on how it's defined, uh, the culture of peace may differ. 
Not only that, we've, think we've been infantilizing youth for up till now. We thought that they were someone to be protected, but now we have to change our perspective to note them as main agents. And here now, just like the slogan goes for the Peace Forum of Pyeongchang, I believe that it's important to make sure that the youth, in terms of instilling peace, uh, should play a core role that they are the main agents right now, here and now. With regard to the questions for the presentations, after we hear from all of our speakers, we would like to gather all of the questions together to have them answered. Thank you. And next, we'll go on to the second presentation to be given by Professor Ioannis Talidis of Gyeonggi University. And he's going to talk about um, graffiti as a topic of peace. So let's listen to his presentation. Uh, I think my topic ties very well to Dr. Zhang's presentation because street art or graffiti being one part of street art is, is a very youthful uh, activity. Um, what I'm going to look at, essentially the topic of my presentation my, is based on my interest in, in peace studies and peace research, which essentially ever since I started is, is looking at the ways in which common people uh, either resist violent practices or they want to find ways to promote peace. Uh, and this particular topic, this particular presentation is, is based on, on the uh, attacks, the terrorist attack in Norway on, on July the 22nd in 2011. And what uh, I found interesting uh, was the reaction of the government, of course, of the people, but also of the government, the reaction to these attacks and the way that they responded. So what I'm going to uh, share with you today, uh, besides some very interesting pictures, is what I think is the main drive and what I think are some of the ways in which everyday people respond with passion towards peace or with the motivation to create peace. Now, just to give you uh, just to give you a small uh, background uh, on that day, uh, one person called Anders Breivik um, he detonated a bomb of almost a ton in the government quarter in Oslo where uh, some people died because of the explosion, where all the ministries are housed. And uh, he calculated that with this attack, obviously the, the full attention of the emergency services are going to be uh, uh, there. So he then got in a, uh, in a van, drove to uh, Utoya Island where the youth uh, socialist party was uh, having a summer camp and as he was dressed as a policeman, when he got off the island, he started shooting uh, uh, children as young as, as 10, as old as 16. Uh, about 65 or 66 kids died uh, of their injuries. Um, he later, we later got hold of his manifesto, which was pretty much of the far right, very anti-Islamic, very anti-refugee, very anti European uh, in certain uh, sense, uh, and he his drive was to see Europe and Norway in particular be devoted to patriarchy, go back to traditional values like patriarchy, like Christianity, and essentially annihilate this phenomenon of what he calls Eurabia. Now, as I said, uh, to those of us who are observers of uh, and scholars of what is going on in conflicts and what is going on in uh, terrorism, um, the reaction of the government to these attacks, we haven't really seen in any other countries. Usually what we see uh, is more restriction of freedoms. We, usually what we see is more surveillance. Usually what we see is increased security overall. The reaction in Norway was the complete opposite. More, as the, the then prime minister put it, we need more openness, more democracy. We need more tolerance. Okay, uh, And this is something that you don't really see, as I said, when you, when you look at terrorist conflicts. This is actually very significant when you're looking, from my point of view, when you're looking at the field of international relations, at the field of international security, this is very significant about the, the, the everyday and the role that it has to play, because usually the everyday is considered as something that it doesn't really have much to say and it de definitely doesn't have much to do. 
because the decisions are being taken always at a higher level, whether it's the prime ministers, whether it's the presidents, whether it's the chiefs of staff of the army uh, or the security uh, cadres and, and so on. So in that sense, this particular topic is, is very interesting. Um, another thing that we need to take into account when we're talking about the street and its combination with art and its combination with the everyday people is that it's something that is, is uh, pretty much a pillar of critical peace research, which is that everybody has a different definition of peace, as Dr. Zhang briefly mentioned in the previous presentation. So you need to take into account how cacophonic peace is on the everyday level. There's different individuals, there's different actors, each one of them with different agendas, different motives, different interests. Uh, and, and this is interesting because when you look at it this way, you can't expect traditional methodologies, you can't expect traditional uh, ways of doing research to give you a lot of uh, insights or sufficient insights. And this is where I come in with this research of looking at if there is any way to realize or if there's any way to essentially capture the, the wishes and the needs and the wants of those people that traditional theories say that they don't really have much to do with uh, uh, formulating theories or formulating policies. So when you look at it this way, obviously, can we look at street art as something that can make all those everyday voices that are marginalized? Can it make them more visible? Can, can we say that it can promote other alternative or more everyday approaches to understanding international relations? And, and my answer to that after looking at all of these and some other cases is that of course it can, because the street is essentially where everything happens. The street is both the way in which the message is delivered, but it's also the message itself. It, it contains the, the message itself. The street has all of that. And we also know from previous uh, uh, research that art has a catalytic uh, role to play when it comes to, to conflict. Uh, a second thing to bear in mind when we're talking about streets and street art is that spaces are not neutral. Okay, we, the, There needs to be differentiation between places and spaces. Places are what they are, but they become spaces when we, all of us or some of us, uh, appoint some kind of meaning to it. Okay, so for example, you can't take you can't take your food into a restaurant to eat your own food at the restaurant. The restaurant is a place, but it becomes a space because of the rules that it has. Same kind of thing with an auditorium. Okay, you can't do certain things at an auditorium, or rather, you are expected to do certain things and follow certain behavioral rules at an auditorium. This is what makes it a space. Uh, um, the same is true when it comes to security. When you see security bar barriers, when you see surveillance cameras, you obviously have uh, uh, indirectly, you do get the message that there is a bit of insecurity in this space. And that's why we need all this equipment to protect us from, from all that. Uh, so with all that in mind, street art is becoming particularly interesting as a point of analysis, because first of all, it's, it's not like galleries. Okay, you, you, you don't get invited. The message that you find in street art is essentially addressed to everybody. Everybody who passes by can see that message and is affected in one way or another, negatively or positively, and develops an opinion, again, negative or positive, about the message that is directed to them. Second, because it is street art, because it is something that is on somebody's wall, it is a form of dissensus. It goes against the power and the control that says, don't paint here, don't destroy these buildings and so on, right? And finally, there's another link to, to terrorism at least, which is, it is the same space, it is the same place where terrorism happens, okay? So it, it is, if you want, the counterforce to terrorism in these spatial, uh, um, in these spatial references. Um, third, in terms of art, the second half of the street art, um, we, I mentioned earlier how art has always been used to depict the horrors of war or to uh, used as, as a way of healing. And we know that all you need to do is like look at the UN Security Council and you will see uh, uh, Picasso's Guernica uh, being there. Uh, but 
in if you look at art theory, there's a very interesting term about artivism and artivists, obviously the combination between art and activism. And artivists are considered to be individuals who uh, change or aim to change political and social conditions. And they do that through a variety of artistic practices, whether it's street art, as I'm going to be talking about today, or whether it's dancing or whether it's uh, uh, um, stand-up comedy or, or theater or whatever it might be. So in that sense, then, here is another link where the everyday, uh, those people that are considered to be to have no role to play at what is going on. Those who are not asked what it is that they want, what do they think about peace or what do they think about the conflict? Uh, here's another way then that they actually can express themselves and they are not as invisible as we are being led to believe. So we see some kind of consciousness. The consciousness comes, obviously, we are very unconscious, you, me, all of us who are considered to be everyday, right? We are very unconscious when we just go about our business. But when we see a message, an artistic message, and we act upon it, this is when we become very conscious. And this means that we have agency because we might be led to join a protest, we might be led to join a manifestation, and so on and so forth. And to a certain extent, this is how a lot of revolutions have happened throughout history. This is how the Arab Spring happened uh, 10 years ago in, in a lot of the countries in the Middle East. And this is essentially how power relations have been transformed. I mentioned the Arab Spring. Essentially, this is how the, the catastrophe and the war in Syria started. It took 15 young boys who painted uh, anti-establishment and anti-authority, anti-Assad graffitis in a little town called Dera. And they were arrested, uh, all of them tortured, some of them killed by the security forces because of, of their torture. And this is how the Arab Spring started in Syria. This is what led to a lot of people uh, uh, mobilizing and getting to the street to protest about it. And we are still in that situation now. So we started from a very small level, 15 young kids who painted a graffiti. And we now find ourselves in a situation where all major international powers are involved. All regional players are involved in that conflict. And there is no end, at least to this day, there is no end to this conflict. So here is another example of how uh, those of us who are considered to be uninvolved and marginalized and as, as if we have nothing to do with what is going on in international relations and international security, this is how we can affect, we can affect the way that conflicts are going or the way that peace is being established. Here are some examples from around the world before I go into Norway. This is a collection of stencils of uh, missed people, uh, people who went missing, uh, most of them uh, kidnapped by the security services of Yemen. Uh, this is a graffiti by Murad Sobai, just to raise awareness and just to keep reminding everybody of who these people are and when they are going to come back, if ever they are going to come back. Another, another uh, uh, stencil in Egypt uh, by uh, Mohammed Fami, where you can see a tank on the left, uh, and a bicycle on the right with a boy that is carrying a tray of bread. And this is an interesting one because in Arabic, or at least in Egyptian the Arabic, the, the word for bread sounds very much like the word for life. So when you, when you see, when you look at the stencil this way, then you obviously look at a tongue uh, aiming at life rather than just a kid. But both meanings are, are equally important in the interpretation. The panda that you see behind the boy was added later, so I, I don't really have that much to say about it. Uh, finally, this is another stencil, this is another uh, um, uh, practice in Pakistan by a few artists who are producing these massive, huge posters uh, of, of children who died in drone attacks by the US Army. And essentially the campaign was named not a bug splat because this is how drone operators, how US pilots refer to their, their victims because they, they look like bugs in their screens when they release the, the bombs from the drones. So essentially the, this particular uh, campaign was all about humanizing, trying to humanize those pilots behind the, the drones in order to make them look at the faces of the kill kids that, that they are killing, that these are not bugs, these are not insects, they are m normal normal people. Um, so in, in Norway, as I was saying, um, the response to the war, to the terrorist attacks was essentially to move away from excluding uh, more people, uh, constructing dangerous others, right, which is essentially what Breivik was aiming to do. Um, 
So their aim was to promote human rights, to counter intolerance, to counter xenophobia. This was essentially the the, uh, aim of the government. And it was also the aim of of a campaign, of a festival, an art festival that used to take place every year. And that particular year, because of the attacks, the artists that were participating, the street artists that were participating were asked to uh, adapt or to change if they wanted uh, some of their art. And a lot of them, if not all, if I remember, they did. Uh, they did adapt and they did change. I'll, I'll show you some examples. Uh, on the far uh, left, on the top left corner, you see um, a graffiti, which is which are the lyrics from a poem uh, that says, uh, Norway, in this, uh, in this small land, uh, uh, everyone here is either a brother or a friend which again promotes this kind of feeling where we are all connected. Uh, so if, if my next door neighbor suffers, I will suffer as well. So when, when somebody does harm to my next door neighbor, I am harmed as well. So that the only way out of all this is uh, uh, um, sympathy, is uh, um, to walk together in, in the streets of life and so on. On the top right, uh, after the attacks, you saw a lot of this particular graffiti where Oslo was written with the two hearts, uh, as well as the other two that I have at the bottom, where July 22 was depicted as a heart and the message of we shall live in peace uh, someday. Uh, This one uh, by Shepard Ferry, the artist Shepard Ferry, Uh, this was uh, one stencil that he did many, many years ago, but he used it because he thought it was very apt, because the red flower is the symbol for the Socialist Party and the, the white flower is the symbol of the Youth Socialist Party, which is essentially the kids that were shot down at the, the, the summer camp of the Youth Socialist Party uh, on that day. But if you look at the picture on the right, uh, his, er, his other stencil that he did many years ago was essentially to obey. Uh, and again, that was a way of criticizing power, authority, and so on. And now, what he, uh, what you can see, if you can see with yellow letters, is his message of disobey. And disobey as a message of disobey the war on terror. Disobey those that tell you that we need more security, you need to give up more of your rights, uh, you need to give up more of your liberties and your freedoms if you want to be secure. Uh, So essentially we see that kind of a reaction where it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, this is another one from that same festival where the original was the original message of Martin Watson, the artist, was lost hope. And he decided to change him by essentially erasing the word lost and just keeping the word uh, uh, hope. And this is the final one where the artist Logan Hicks, you can see it's 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 a, uh, the depiction of some very cold spaces. And I say cold. Not just because of the color, but because if you if you look at it, they are pretty much empty. I know it's not the perfect angle, but if you if you uh, look closer, you will see that all these spaces are empty. There are no people, but all this yellow and gold uh, serves as the the point of hope that eventually things will turn. There is hope at the end of the tunnel. Um, so in, in that particular case in Norway, we see the same kind of message everywhere. A- and we need to take something else into account. And I'll, this is, will be my, my final point of the presentation. We've never seen such inclusionary efforts when it comes to war on terror, when it comes to countering terrorism. Uh, and, and this is coming from a country that is pretty much known to be a a, a pluralist democracy or an example for other pluralist democracy and pacifist values. Um, And it's also a country that is very known uh, to uh, mediate and become a negotiator in other uh, conflicts around the world. In fact, it was the only country that when the European Union um, uh, changed its charter on terrorism and counterterrorism, Norway decided to opt out of it because it wanted to continue to mediate in conflicts where terrorism was also present. Uh, The change in the European Union Charter meant that if you ever came into contact, if whoever comes into contact with terrorist groups or armed groups, even if it is for the purposes of peace building, then they will be accused of promoting terrorism. And obviously Norway said it makes no sense because if if you need, if you want to stop conflicts, then you need to have some kind of communication. You need to come into contact with these people. So 
in that particular sense, it's not just the everyday that is marginalized, but we're talking about an entire country that looks at how peace should be defined, how peace should be understood completely differently from everybody else. And in that sense, it is just as marginalized as the very topic of my presentation today, the everyday people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ioannis Talidis, for your presentation. Not just in Korea, but also in Norway, in many countries suffering from or experiencing conflict, graffiti seems to be playing an important role in peace building. Thank you very much for your very specific presentation and examples. We'll have Q&A later on during the discussion session. The next speaker is curator Moon Jung Won. And on the right side of the wall, you can see a video of various cultural activities that are underway and that uh, were put together in this region. And uh, with regard to peace culture, uh, Curator Moon will be giving us some more information and more light on what this was all about. And also, there were a number of activities for the past three years. And we also have Kim Min Young, a student, a, part, a member of the Potato Club. So if you do have any questions for our a student, our member of the club, please feel free to ask him any questions during the Q&A session. So Curator Moon, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Moon Jung Won, Senior Curator at KTNG Sangsang Madang. Today, uh, with the Korea Street Culture Federation for the past two years, there were various peace culture activities that uh, were put together at Pyeongchang with the youth. So let me introduce you to some of our programs. The Constitution of UNESCO indicates that it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. I believe that uh, the activities that we put together uh, can and did contribute to our capabilities to build defenses of peace. And let me now share with you uh, the examples of uh, our activities, a total of three. Uh, the first thing that I would like to introduce is the Pyeongchang uh, Potato Club. All of the activities are based on this club. The Potato Club uh, is a space for culture and arts located in Hwengeri Daegwalyeong of Pyeongchang County. Originally, uh, this was idle space uh, that was left for uh, gardening. And what we did was create this or recreate this into an area of culture uh, and named it the Pyeongchang Potato Club. And ever since 2019 May, uh, we, along with visual artists, conduct workshops and programs uh, for the youth so that they can accumulate knowledge on peace. The images that you see here are the activities that were done at the Potato Club workshop. These are some of the pictures, the photographs. Once every two weeks, uh, with different materials and with different visual artists, we'll come together to uh, be involved in 20 sessions on an annual basis. Uh, the school curricula and uh, some of the resources and materials are quite limited, but what they can do here is try out different resources and something that goes beyond the school curricula. And woodwork, construction, architecture, graffiti, media, facade are some of the activities uh, that are a part of these workshops. And as a result, all of the participants can try out new things and they can invigorate new senses. This next example is the Echo Edu Lab. The Echo Edu Lab uh, establishes a peaceful relationship between human and nature through understanding ecological activities. The Echo Edu Lab is not just about acquiring fragmented knowledge on nature, it's about understanding the overall cycle of nature's ecology. And it also has to do with understanding how an individual's action or decision impacts nature and ecology and acknowledging what kind of consequences that impact may have on us. 
And so it's a type of uh, ecological education program to understand the, the full cycle. And here, Ms. Kang ji was the overall supervisor, and Dr. Kwan gi Sung was the main instructor for this lab work. And I myself and a visual artist was the arts education instructor for this program. The Echo Edge Lab. Uh, it's based on a program from the Smithsonian Institute, and the greatest uh, differentiation point here is that we use an ecological box. I will be giving you some photos to refer to, but what this ecological box is, is a small box. It's about 30 uh, centimeters in width, and you can just put your foot in this box. And what happens? is uh, you install this box in nature where you can understand uh, where your place is in nature and you occupy this space in nature and for a long period of time you observe this area uh, to understand in depth the changes in nature and understand what nature is all about but using this ecological box uh, participants can understand what happens under my footsteps? They understand Earth, and they also increase interest on overall ecology. And based on the understanding on the ecosystem, they can agree on the importance of maintaining biodiversity, and ultimately they can expand understanding on their relationship with the ecosystem and to find a way to enhance life for a sustainable Earth. The Eco Edu Lab consists of lectures, arts activities, as well as sharing sessions, and it consists of five sessions of 10 hours. Uh, and what they can do is use this ecological box, install the box, observe, and also engage in various arts activities and share their findings with the group. What you see here right now, the graphic and the image, are some of the photographs and the materials that are used. The Eco Edu Lab consists of five sessions, as I have already mentioned. The first have to do with the first session has to do with understanding uh, the environment that surrounds me, and then observe the soil, plants, and insects, and. We would go into understanding the meaning uh, to my footsteps and what kind of part I have in nature and my position in nature. Third uh, example is the peace talk. As the name stands, it's about sharing views on peace. It's like a mock summit. It's a mock summit format to enhance understanding of my daily life and on peace. This program in 2020 uh, was first launched at the Pyeongchang International Peace Film Festival, and it involves visual artists as well as film and used as a medium to have 30 members of the Potato Club and Youth of Pyeongchang to, and it's conducted as a mock summit as mentioned. Peace talk has to do with enhancing uh, sensitivity towards value of peace, and it's also about teaching the SDGs of the UN to nurture a global mind. And there is a very interesting BI you see here, and as you all know, it, it comes from the symbol of the UN. And we, because this was conducted in Kangwon province, we've included the map of Kangwon-do to add meaning to add meaning to this peace talk. This is our curriculum, a detailed program. Peace talk is about the youth uh, playing the role of a head of state, and uh, they present uh, a peace agenda. And this is all brought together to agree upon a peace declaration. So it was a two-day workshop. And you can see that the format is quite similar to that of an international conference. We tried to make it as similar as possible. This program was joined by visual artist Park Hae-min. Uh, artist Park Hae-min has a project named Ordinary Nations, and this project has to do with starting off with constructing a country that they want to live in, and it's about running this country. 
And this program uh, was applied to our Peace Talk workshop, and it was like one big performance. The participants here through Peace Talk was able to raise their uh, understanding on peace, uh, engage in debate, uh, take part in arts activities, and also as a performer, they were able to create something anew based on the, uh, their ideas. The Peace Talk consists of three phases or steps. The very first step well, is first on the word of peace, anything that comes to mind when you think of peace. And based on their definition of peace, they would decide or imagine a peaceful state or peaceful country. Uh, the participants will decide on the name of that country and they will also make the national flag and the symbol or badge of that country to represent that country and they become the head of that particular state that they created. And the second phase, or uh, step two, is uh, involves a lot of content. It start, we start off with the discussions and debate. I've mentioned that all of the participants will become a head of a particular state that they created, and the heads of state, uh, based on a predefined agenda, will engage in a pro-con debate. The detailed agenda was as follows. Here it is indicated on this slide. It has to do with cultural diversity, distribution, war, uh, as well as migrants and environmental protection. So using an OX card uh, representing their country, they will decide whether they are pro or con and debate the reasons behind their position. And what the participants do here is connect the social phenomenon with the uh, definition of peace. And it also helps them understand and access peace uh, in a familiar fashion. And this is step three, which is the peace declaration. This is when the participants adopt a peace declaration. And at this phase, we have three teams where they engage in their debate and they go through a process to bring about a peace declaration. These three teams uh, will be presented with 10 items. And the 10 items are democracy, respect and concession, discrimination, happiness, freedom, equals equality, support, protect the vulnerable, right to education, environment, and war and violence. We provided them with the factors and the teams in three will go through all of these items and uh, they will shed some more light on these factors to create their own peace declaration. And the individual teams, as you can see here, will draft their own version of a peace declaration. And uh, the three peace declarations from the respective teams were brought together and classified as such. Uh, you can see that uh, some uh, of the factors were used in all of the teams and some just by a couple of the teams. And this is the very last step where uh, these peace declarations are brought together and there's another pro and con debate to come up with the final version of a peace declaration. Uh, the heads of state would go into the individual factors and engage in discussion on what should be included in the final version. And as a result, out of the 10 factors, seven were selected in the final version of the peace declaration. You can see here we have uh, democracy, discrimination, respect and concession, happiness, freedom, right to education and environment was included in the final version, as well as the remaining three areas uh, were not reflected, unfortunately, in the final version. Afterwards, the participants also had the opportunity to express this outcome in artwork. It can be just in document, but what we did here was help them uh, decorate uh, the peace declaration to find a way to break ice and to have fun. And this also has to do with enhancing their responsibility and accountability to this declaration and to familiarize themselves with this final version. And this final version was uh, pronounced as such. 
And what you see here on the right uh, is uh, the uh, final decoration or artwork that was put together by all of the participants. It looks like contemporary art, and it was a. It also looks like a type of banner that indicates uh, a keen argument by the participants, and. We also have the document version, which was provided to the uh, host organizers of the program. This declaration uh, was posted on the walls, and uh, we went through a final consensus session to see whether we are, are in agreement. And then we also put together this template where everybody would sign if they do agree. So all of the heads of state will sign, provide their signature to consent that they agree to the final version. And what we did here uh, was uh, to also uphold uh, the spirit behind Pyeongchang International Peace Film Festival and to also make sure that we can raise the um, value that this declaration carries. We had Chairperson Bang Eun-jin as well as Chairman Moon sung uh where they were also a part of uh, this ceremony in delivering the declaration to the film festival. Uh, afterwards, we delivered uh, the copies of the declaration to our individual participants, and we had this commemorative photo, and this was the end of the Peace Talk program. Uh, before, yes, I go into the suggestions. With regard to our activities, there is a short video that I want to share with you. Uh, if you can spare uh, me a couple of minutes for this video, please. These are some of the images of the Potato Club. It's to uh, raise awareness on peace. So these are some of the workshops that were uh, uh, that were done, and this is the Echo Edu Lab. Such cultural and arts activities uh, enable the participants to understand their preferences and their values. In the process of collaboration, we understand me and we, so they start to understand the basic relationship behind peace. With these activities, 
Uh, we were able to identify certain possibilities and potential for the future. Uh, it's true that a the topic of peace is a vast and deep discourse for an individual. However, to instill a culture of peace, it's important to have peace in our everyday life, to build peace at the micro level. So cultural and arts activities to induce curiosity and build a relationship between myself and peace, I believe, is important. The ecological environment can also be a part of peace, and film can also be an important medium to discuss peace. I believe that uh, this can be the first step to establishing peace culture in youth. The activities at Pyeongchang Potato Club was a process of seeing myself under a different light within the set circumstances and renew relationship with my surrounding. It's also about forming a consensus on our ideal way forward. This serves as uh, the first step towards a culture of peace. Experience like these during one's youth years will be uh, the very seeds that begin a forest of world of peace. And uh, the Potato Club will continue on to engage in various activities. And with that, let me conclude my presentation. Thank you. There were various meaningful cultural activities uh, that were conducted here in the region. And thank you very much for sharing with us your examples. Our last speaker is Professor Kwon Gi Sung of Kangwon National University. And he's going to talk about the uh, cases of sports with regards to peace culture for youth in Kangwon. Good morning, I am Kwon Gi Sung. And uh, in fact, in the video that you just saw, uh, you probably saw my face also. I was featured there. And so many of the youth uh, oftentimes don't understand what I teach, what I am about. Uh, honestly, I've never really spoken about sports, uh, specifically here in Pyeongchang. So it's usually about peace or ecology. And it was actually the first time for me to teach the youth. I've never done that before coming to Pyeongchang area. And so initially I said I refused the position because I don't have a background in teaching the uh, young students. But then I gave it a try after coming to Pyeongchang and I was able to teach many students. So I appreciate that opportunity. I majored in sports management and uh, I taught sports industry to uh, my university students. So today my presentation will be on my area of expertise. And please put up my slide. What I want to share with you today is sports, youth, peace, Olympics, and their connections. Sometimes uh, it seems like the connection, the fact that they're connected is forced upon us. But I just want to explain to you that all of these things come together because when you engage in sports, you can enjoy peace and uh, there are indeed uh, clear connections among these principles or among these concepts. So please just uh, be relaxed and listen to my presentation because it's going to be on a lighter note. As for my PowerPoint slides, they're mostly just um, capture, screen captures from the IOC website. So the IOC has as its core Olympic values, excellence, respect, and friendship. And so peace is actually a most important, the most important element, which has all three values as the foundation. So whether it's the Olympics or the World Cup Games, oftentimes there are different sports events uh, that are participate. And so from a sports management perspective, well, we usually focus on the different uh, events and how we manage them. So what we do is we look at whether this is a double or a single or a group match. Is it indoor, outdoors? Is it an international or a local sports mostly? And is this sport event held 
uh, by cities or by country level. So that it would be the criteria for our class, the classification. To understand the concept of Olympics, let's do a comparison with the World Cups. In the case of the Olympics, it's the cities that is important, Pyeongchang, Seoul Olympics. But the 2024 Youth Olympics, Winter Olympics, will be a bit different because it is uh, Gangwon province-based and not city-based uh, Olympics. So I think uh, that is just a brief explanation of the branding logic behind it. Uh, Lausanne and Innsbruck uh, Olympics, they were all city-based Olympics. So to compare this with World Cup games, World Cup is country-based sports event. So we have uh, several World Cup stadiums in Korea, but then for the Olympics, it's Pyeongchang or Seoul or other city-based international games. Another difference is that in the case of World Cups, they use outdoor stadiums. So they use the football field, the outdoor facilities. But then for the Olympics, we use indoors, outdoors, and and in remote places or far away places. So we use the existing roads or the infrastructure in the case of the marathon, for example. So and World Cup and Olympics also all are international level uh, games. So before COVID-19, we thought that um, there was not much difference between the two because you just needed a visa to go to a country. But then after COVID pandemic, we have a huge change. You have to be in self-quarantine for several weeks before you participate in any sports games. I thought that he had a question he was raising his hand. But anyhow, so uh, whether it's domestic or international, that criteria has changed a lot. So again, in the case of the Olympics, it is an international level, indoor, outdoor, and existing infrastructure-based sports event. And so if we go on to the next page, it says peace through sports. And this is a slogan from the IOC. Uh, in the case of Pyeongchang, well, it has hosted the Olympics and it also wants to carry on the values of the Olympics as a legacy of the hosting of the Olympics. So excellence, respect and friendship. And we can add a piece here. Peace to IOC has a very unique significance. Sports is something that many people are interested in. A lot of people are participating. So it is a well-loved content. However, because of certain situations, there are limitations in sports. Uh, it may become very difficult to directly participate in sports events. However, peace is a common value for all humanity. So as IOC sees it, it is a way for us to prevent such problems from occurring. And uh, it could be a source of energy that will enable us to continue to pursue these sports events, to engage in these activities. So it is peace is indeed another legacy of IOC or uh, the sports events. Also, uh, sports can or Olympic can actually contribute to building peace. So one example would be the Pyeongchang Olympics, where, uh, which has led to reconciliation mood between the two Koreas. Yesterday, the IOC president, Thomas Park, did mention uh, during his speech that the negotiation process was uh, very uh, speedy. There was no final decision until four hours right before the beginning of the Olympic Games. And also, there was a team for the refugees that was formed and to reflect and to send out to the world the message from the refugees, their situation. So the global media was utilized to spread the message about the plight of the refugees at the Olympics. So it's uh, you're seeing that more actively the global community is working and moving towards peace building activities.
And as a side note, well, these are the main contents of the IOC hosted Olympics. So the open ceremony, closing ceremony, and they all reflect the message of peace. Now let's turn our attention to the topic of youth. And what significance does the Olympics have for the youth? To be very frank with you, the regular summer or winter Olympics uh, it has much stronger influence than the youth Olympics in terms of the exposure power, in terms of the history, the participation rate. The youth Olympics is actually uh, just in its infancy. But then I think that uh, probably uh, from a marketing perspective, uh, the IOC is using the Youth Olympics uh, to promote it, the different contents that he wants to promote and ha the fact that uh, having this Youth Olympics is going to be helpful to promote sports. So I believe that eventually Youth Olympics will become as important as the Summer or Winter Olympics. So high school students, university students, um, many more students, more countries are trying to participate in the Youth Olympics. So there are different also attempts. Uh, TikTok, SNS, and other platforms are, are now becoming competi uh, competitors against the Olympics. And so IOC uh, needs to work harder to promote the um, Olympics more, particularly the Youth Olympics, because the competition for attention is becoming fiercer. Next, I'd like to talk about the significance of peace in Youth Olympics. In fact, uh, I'd like to talk about this issue in connection with the essence or the nature of sports. So if you look at these specific examples, in the earlier slides I did just skim through them, but there are forums being held uh, during, before, after Youth Olympics, and there are also an event hosted by Monaco, Peace and Sport, for example. In the case of Peace and Sport, it is a European Youth Olympics that is based on the theme of peace. And Peace and Sport is an in important institution, but I'm not going to go into the details. Please just refer to their website. And the website does offer very interesting information about this institution. And so there's a lot of support on peace in youth sports through these different projects and institutions. So. In the Youth Olympics uh, that is hosted by the IOC, uh, also peace in, is considered as one of the most important themes. So now I'd like to talk about why it is possible to use sports in order to deliver the message of peace and peace building by looking at the characteristics of sports. If you look at this slide that I'm showing you right now, these are the new classification of sports industry according to my research. Basically, the classification criteria is the market. So we have different types of markets, traditional markets, we also have the concept of market, but what the biggest uh, characteristic of the market is that there's the consumer, the provider, and the product. So we need to we are able to understand the entire ecosystem by looking at the consumer, provider, and the pro uh, the product individually. So for example, Hyundai Motors uh, and its overseas sales, uh, we can get that number from the provider's perspective. However, what the market provides us is that a classification of the different markets and the sub-markets uh, that are derived from the basic market. And we can get very fine details uh, about the different sub-markets. So 
we have the uh, main market, core market, and under the core market, we can have the spectator sports market and the participating or participant sports market. So I try to use the example of the Olympics. Olympics would be a spectator sports market, but then the youth market, it's a little bit different because as I mentioned earlier, for sports events like the Olympics, which is very powerful in terms of exposure and advertisements, uh, that would be attracting a lot of spectators. But then for the youth market, yes, it has a, a uh, some form of spectator sport market characteristics, but mostly it is a participation-based sports market. In other words, uh, it doesn't receive as much attention as the regular Olympics. So it's mostly the participants themselves that are interested in this youth Olympics. And so uh, it's important to make this a festival, to make more youths participate directly in the youth uh, Olympics, according to the IOC. And so in the case of the Youth Olympics, again, it has the characteristics of being both spectator and participant sports markets. Next, I'd like to talk about the definition of sports. Sports, two definitions. First, physical activity with institutionalized competition. Two, any form of physical activity with an intrinsic purpose of physical achievement. The first definition is used often in the U.S. where professional sports is developed. The second definition is used mostly in European countries where sports in daily life is well developed. So for those working in in the uh, sports industry, the second definition would be most useful. And that is because, for example, jogging or mountain climbing, running. I mean, if we have just used the first definition, all of these daily sports activities will be left out. So the second definition will be most more useful. The go game or paduk is considered as a sports. So uh, just because you're good at um, making the moves or you're very graceful at making making uh, the physical moves doesn't mean that you are good at the uh, paduk or go game. So that's why we have decided to classify it as a mind sports. So it's the power of the mind that is used in this sport activity. And another would be eSports. Objectively speaking, I mean, there's no problem. The mouse, the looking at the monitor using the mouse. And so the physical movements affect your uh, results. However, the problem is that all of the uh, these in the case of the esports, there are licenses that you need to think about, and there are uh, certain companies that develop these games, and so this licensing issue can be very complicated in the case of esports. But what I'm trying to drive at is that this concept of sports is all around you. It's not something that is far off. Sports is something that we can do anytime, anywhere, on a daily basis. And that is the gist of my message. The next is the concepts of uncertainty and the pursuit of pleasure. So the English word hedonic is used here. That's why I uh, expressed it as pleasure. So the two characteristics of sports is that first, it is experience-based. Before you directly experience the sports, you cannot understand the quality. And so it leads to certain limitations. First, you need to listen to what others say. And uh, secondly, you need to have prior information somewhat. So that's why it makes it interesting. Because if you know who's going to win in the end, no one is going to watch the sports game. So the competition balance in sports, that is what makes sports interesting. And then honestly, you know, there are people who walk or run. When you look at them, I mean, there's no one with a very 
uh, ugly face uh, because they engage in these sports voluntarily. They enjoy doing these sports activities. And so uh, if you look at these people and the kinds of preferences that they have, the personal choices are reflected. They have uh, loyalty. It's habitual. It is based on information and it's based on pleasure. So what's the most interesting here is the habitual consumption of sports. You all go to supermarkets, right? So most of the people have about 70% of the same consumption patterns. In other words, you don't want to think too much. So when you go to the supermarket, that person does the same thing, buys the same product 70% of the time. It's the same for sports. So if you are loyal to a certain professional team, you rarely change your team. So all of these come together to lead to a very interesting result. It gives us an opportunity to be very passionate about the sports. Uh, it can make you crazy, in other words. There's no other uh, field that is going to give you this result as much as sports. So I think this is actually a positive outcome of sports and engagement in sports. The pa fact that you can actually be really passionate, this passionate about something. So, my last slide will talk about why is it we need to think about peace through sports. So the World Cup games uh, that Korea hosted, it was a long time ago, so I can not talk about that anymore. But anyhow, when there's an international, this big sports event, people uh, become very passionate. And then when they are so interested in these sports, they begin to very easily accept all of the information that is provided. That is why sponsors love sports events, and that is why we have to use sports in order to deliver the message of peace. In fact, uh, this is based on our physical uh, processing abilities and characteristics. And so when we use sports, we can very easily inscribe the important message of peace in the minds of the people. And I believe my time is up, so I will end my presentation. Thank you very much. Based on the uh, definition or characteris characteristics of sports, how can we use sports in order to promote peace? That was the main message of this presentation. Thank you very much. Before we go into panel discussions, are there any questions or comments from the floor? If not, well, uh, with regard to Dr. Zhang's presentation, I did have a question. You talked about the uh, peace uh, in the process. Is this really possible? Is there an example uh, where the process of peace, did that actually lead to concrete peace overall? If you can give us an example, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, there are also some questions that came in online, and there are a couple of questions for Dr. Chang, of course. Uh, so the first would be on the perception of peace of the youth in Korea. And the youth, are they against uh, unification? Uh, was there any survey on that? So in other words, it's about whether you have any understanding or was there a survey on the perceptive or perception towards unification in the youth here in Korea? First of all, thank you very much for your question and the questions. And if I may briefly answer the very first question, in 2019, January, I went along with uh, FAO. I looked into uh, what kind of impact uh, activities have uh, in Mali and Iraq, El Salvador, and Kyrgyzstan were some of the countries where an on site survey was conducted on how such activities have an impact. In Mali, we still have many internal strife and conflict. And what I witnessed there in Mali was the following. 
in order to build peace in the region. It was not just about providing a blind supply of food. It was preconditioned. For instance, if the region lacked water, what would happen was in order to solve the water issues, we would have all of the members of the community come together. There would be women, youth, uh, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the disabled would all come together in one location. And we would talk about what kind of resources are necessary in order to solve the war water shortage issues. In many cases, they would talk about the importance of dams or um, or facilities, more so on the hardware side. And if that is decided upon amongst the members of the community, what would happen is the vulnerable will take part in uh, labor in building these facilities and as uh, a reward for their labor they get food so the poverty uh, the, the, the impoverished uh, they would get food but they would also provide their labor uh, to build facilities which would help solve the water shortage issues and this would lead to build an infrastructure uh, that would uh, help improve agricultural produce for instance so you can see that with water shortage at the center, there was this case where this issue was resolved by having a positive impact on various groups. And the we, what we tried to do was make sure that the benefits would go around and that the marginalized and the vulnerable will also be a part of the decision-making process to make sure that this process is fair and equal. So I think that this could be one example that I can share with you to respond to your question. But the problem here is that there are differences to these examples depending on the region or the village. For instance, there are villages where the conventional wisdom holds so strong. Then. What they believe is, uh, well, in many cases, the owner of the, of nature of that environment in many cases are noted as the village head or the village leader. And if there is a drought or a flood, for instance, what would happen is the village leader will be distributing the lots of land, for instance, to the members of the village so that they can um, guarantee a minimum level of life. This is this kind of worked as a social safety net that was led by the village leader. So they do get food for their labor, but uh, what happens is this village le leader would collect all of the food back, and then the village le leader would redistribute the food equally amongst the members of the village. So in the eyes of the Westerners or for the organizations that supply or provide food or food aid may think that this is unjust. Uh, depending on the values uh, that a group has, some may think that this is not just and may wonder up to what extent can we actually intervene in this uh, process that the village had all along. And what we decided to do was not intervene too much because it may collapse uh, the social structure of that village. But we did witness uh, various situations and we thought that this is a delicate issue and it's something where we cannot just have a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. So next with regard to the perception on unification amongst the youth. Uh, also, on the, uh, I do not have uh, figures as to who is uh, against or who is for unification, but I know that Kino and various other unification-related institutes on a regular basis conduct a survey against uh, all people, uh, all Koreans. And when we think of peace, uh, many people respond that peace equals unification. That uh, is something that I know for sure. So in this discourse of reunification, we're very much engrossed in that. And the peace uh, that is mentioned in the global stage may be a bit different from what we hear here in Korea. But recently, many scholars that study unification say that internal or domestic peace and this unification 
uh, it's important to shed some global light to such domestic issues, and I know that the efforts are out there. Yes, thank you very much. And I also had a couple of questions, so I'd like to ask this question to uh, Professor Ioannis Teledis. In conflict regions, or in the case of the Nordic countries, so that was the focus of your uh, presentations and explanation of the different examples. But then, if you try to put that in Korea, would it be possible to do conduct some kind of related research here in South Korea? And we are trying to establish a peaceful culture here in Korea as well. So what kind of role can these efforts play? Yes, it's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have been trying to find uh, some spaces where peace-related graffiti can be seen. Um, but obviously, it's it's not as uh, expansive as you can find in active conflict zones. Uh, I mean, active. Technically, we are in a war zone. But uh, I mean, in places like Yemen or in places like East Timor or where Mali was mentioned earlier. Um, my answer kind of contradicts uh, Dr. Zhang's uh, reply in the second question, because the conversation I have been having with my students uh, ever since I joined Kyung Hee University, um, it, there seems to be a lot of skepticism by the youth about unification. Uh, and this usually has to do, first of all, it starts with uh, the costs of such an endeavor. I mean, young people, and uh, the reason why I mention it is because when I came as an outsider, uh, I, I brought with me my impression as an out, uh, my impressions as an outsider of, of what Korea is, what the division is, and what the future holds. And obviously, uh, beyond Korea, we we all have this impression that everybody wants unification or reunification. Uh, but the the perception that I got from my students, uh, a lot of my students, obviously not everybody is against. But as I said, a lot of them are skeptical. How much will it cost? Uh, and a lot of them used the example of Germany's unification for that. Uh, and when faced with such costs, what will that mean for them? Uh, because there's already some problems in, in the job market. A lot of them do find it uh, particularly difficult um, to enter the job market, at least now. If, if things improve, I, I imagine their answers are going to change as well. Um, so compared to the older generations, at least the young people that I interact with in the university space, uh, they do show a lot of they do show a lot of skepticism, and quite often, besides the material dimensions, there's also um, the linguistic skepticism. A lot of them have mentioned how they they don't feel as close to the the kinsmen up north uh, as their older uh, generations, as their grandparents uh, or even their parents felt. Uh, and a lot of them mentioned the difference in language, that language has now started to separate to quite a degree compared to when their grandparents were speaking it and so on. So there's a cultural dimension there as well. Uh, as I said, this doesn't necessarily mean that they are against, but they are definitely skeptical. They, they definitely worry about the smoothness of such an endeavor. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are against peace. Uh, uh, obviously, they are preoccupied about that. They want to see some kind of peace prevail. But when it comes to it with links with, with art, uh, uh, I, at least, me personally, I haven't been exposed to these kind of powerful messages as I've seen in, and, and as I've researched in other places. Thank you very much for your very exact assessment of the situation in Korea, particularly from an outsider's perspective. And when we do have another opportunity in the future, we hope to engage in joint research on this very important topic. So thank you very much. And uh, we have, we wanted to give questions to Curator Moon and Professor Kwon as well, but then we only have two minutes left. So I'd like to give you one minute each for your closing remarks, Curator Moon and Professor Kwon. Yes, uh, Curator Moon. Uh, this work, uh, art workshop on peace, uh, has uh, given me the opportunity to look into the definition of peace, and I think peace is all about balance. And our arts and activities is also about uh, nurturing that sense of balance. 
So we always try to provide new materials, work with new artists, and provide them with new surroundings and circumstances to make sure that the youth have no limitations or restrictions when it comes to expressing their beliefs, their views. Uh, that was a key purpose. And I believe that this is something that is necessary because we always have to adapt to different and foreign situations. And I believe that this can help us build that sense of balance in difficult and unfamiliar situations. I hope that in the future, our youth has that sense of balance, equip themselves with that balance uh, to create a better world and we'll try to make sure that we can contribute. Dr. Kwan. The fact that Pyeongchang uh, or Gangwon Province will be hosting the Youth Olympics, I think that's a great opportunity. We can use the existing facilities from the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. But I'm really hoping that this will be an Olympic led by the youth themselves, uh, that the youth will not be just guests, but they will be the direct agents and the main players in the uh, upcoming Olympics so that this event will be really inscribed in the heart of all of the participating youth. That's my hope. Thank you very much. So in this session on peace culture for youth, we've had excellent discussion and we really appreciate the participation of our speakers and panelists as well as our audience, uh, particularly the audience who are here physically. Thank you very much for being here despite COVID-19. So with this, we will conclude our session. And last but not least, we have Kim Mi-kyung, a member of Potato Club, who is here with us. So thank you.